6 June 1944, D-Day. The Allied forces surprise attack on Nazi Europe begins. Paratroopers land on the flanks of the invasion beaches, followed by nearly 7,000 ships and landing craft. For the men arriving in landing craft, the wade to shore is treacherous. The boats can't maneuver close enough to the beach, so they unload the troops in water over their heads. Laden with 70-pound packs, many soldiers drown. Although the end result of the greatest amphibious assault in history is victory for the Allies, the unnecessary loss of life is staggering. Bodies of soldiers cover the beach, while hundreds more lay beneath the water. The lessons learned in World War II of building power from the sea and projecting it ashore are the foundation of today's amphibious assault tactics. In many ways, all that's changed is the delivery vehicle. Landing craft air cushion, the LCAC. Soldiers no longer drown or wallow or even need to go into battle with soggy socks from wading into shore. The LCAC delivers them and their gear dry and ready to fight. This revolutionary piece of equipment has forever altered the amphibious assault. Amphibious warfare is the invasion of enemy-held territory from the sea. Simple enough, right? Wrong. Undertaking such an operation involves full integration of air, land, and sea forces from the planning stage onwards. It means transporting specially trained troops to a designated landing beach in enemy-held territory. Then their tanks, artillery, and supplies ashore from landing craft under an umbrella of fire support from the air and sea, and securing a beachhead from which an advance inland can be made. When you think about going in and buying property that you don't own, uh, and the other person who owns it doesn't want you to have it, there are only a couple of ways you can get it. Uh, one is from the land, and if you don't own the property next door, then that doesn't leave you any choice. You have to go in from the sea. During the Gulf War, we got lucky. Saudi Arabia supported United Nations sanctions against its neighbor, Iraq. Coalition forces had access to Saudi airfields and ports, which put them in an ideal position to bomb Iraq and push Saddam Hussein's troops out of Kuwait. But chances are slim that the United States will find such favorable circumstances for any future conflict. So the Navy Marine Corps team continues to hone their amphibious assault skills. In 1984, a powerful new tool emerged, the LCAC. It is the most dramatic innovation in amphibious warfare technology since the invention of the landing craft. First time I saw one of these boats down in Panama City, Florida, I thought, you know, this is, this is Star Wars. I mean, this is the future. This is what it's all about. Suddenly, the world's coastlines became remarkably more accessible. The LCAC, or, or Landing Craft Air Cushion, that's what LCAC stands for. It represents uh, pretty much a new evolution in amphibious assault vehicles, and it has uh, 
given the Navy um, a new capability in that uh, we can assault now close to 70% of the world's beaches, and I think the other figure was uh, about 30% prior to using the LCUs and the Mike boats and the old eight boats. You know. Conventional landing craft hit from only two to 4,000 yards offshore, a pot shot for mobile artillery. LCACs can be loaded with troops and equipment more than 50 miles offshore, safely over the horizon from threats. Transiting at high speeds, LCACs can enter an area and virtually surprise the enemy, leaving them little time to react. Because this distinctive looking craft can go from water to land without stopping, the almost suicidal infantry charge across an open beach is no longer necessary. Troops and equipment can be safely deposited where they can most effectively begin their fight. So how can this mystical craft travel from water to land so effortlessly? It flies. The craft has four main propulsion engines um, and two gas turbines that are generators. Uh, the craft is lifted by four centrifugal lift fans. So the drivetrain actually drives the lift system and the propulsion system at the same time. The craft is lifted about four and a half feet above the surface of the ground or the water, whichever one that we're flying over. And then the propellers are they're variable pitch propellers and they provide the propulsion for the forward thrust. And being that they're a variable pitch, we can actually turn it in its own craft length. That the craft can pivot without, you know, moving forward or, or backward. Its air cushion is held beneath its hull by flexible skirts. The skirts concentrate and protect the craft's upward thrust. LCACs can maneuver independently of all but the heaviest surf conditions and can negotiate sloping dunes and four-foot obstacles on land. When it's in the water, it travels at speeds in excess of 40 knots. On land, it cruises at 25. The USS Wasp belongs to the first class of ships designed specifically to accommodate all the tools of amphibious assault. It holds three LCACs in its belly and up to eight Harriers and 30 helicopters on its decks. As the assault force approaches foreign shores, LCACs begin their descent from the well deck of the Wasp. Ballast tanks, more commonly associated with submarines, fill with water, lowering the rear of the wasp and flooding the well deck so the LCACs can float out. LCACs only need about a foot of water, but the well deck can drop low enough to draw in six to eight feet, enough to accommodate traditional amphibious assault vehicles. Leaving the well deck is a fairly straightforward procedure but returning to the ship can be a little tricky. And then there's been times when you come up to a ship and the weather's so bad, you don't know whether to land on the flight deck or the well deck, because the flight deck actually looks closer. The well decks are primarily made out of wood, which keeps the LCACs from being damaged when heavy seas bounce them around. But LCAC operators get plenty of practice before trying to make one of those landings. This unassuming looking metal box houses a state-of-the-art LCAC trainer. LCAC drivers, just like pilots, spend umpteen hours in a simulator practicing every maneuver hundreds of times before they fly the real thing. There's a lot of white knuckling involved there. The ship's going up and down and the LCAC's going up and down and it's pitch black outside because of the cloud cover and the only thing you see is this, this lights, it's like a cave, you know, and uh, we were probably 20 foot from the sill and the pitching of the boat and the LCAC and the wiper arm broke on the Craftmaster window, and I mean nothing, you know, and it's kind of like close your eyes and hope you make it in there. The 
the LCAP, a vehicle the size and dimensions of a small apartment building, is extraordinarily difficult to drive. Just like on any native ship, it's a team effort. But the overall responsibility for the craft and its crew lies in the hands of the craft master. I think I've got the best job there because uh, I'm, I'm the driver. Uh, I have to work very closely with the rest of the crew members. Uh, you have to have total trust in the guys that you're working with. Uh, the navigator, the engineer, uh, the load master, and the deck mechanic, they're all integral. Uh, parts of the crew. Um, I have the responsibility of uh, operating the craft safely and getting the Marines and their equipment to the beach and uh, that's something that uh, only a couple of hundred guys in the world do actually flying these these crafts. The craft master is unique. Normally being the captain of the ship is a privilege reserved for commissioned officers who spend years being groomed for command. Craft masters are enlisted personnel, specially trained and entrusted with a tremendous responsibility. We're pretty unique in that uh, the hovercraft has an all enlisted crew. Uh, all the operators are enlisted, unlike a, uh, a high dollar jet fighter or a bomber or something like that. Now, I fall under uh, Navy Regs Chapter 8, which is uh, the same as uh, the captain of a ship. Each LCAC is worth $20 million. The average craftmaster makes around $30,000 a year. It's one of the most exciting things I can do, and I love to fly the boat. Like I said, it's an e-ticket ride. It's better than anything in Disneyland. So um, maybe I've gotten used to it. I, I hope I don't get used to it, because that's when it's time to quit flying. The loadmasters, as their name implies, are in charge of loading the LCAC. It can carry cargo weighing upwards of 60 tons, an M1 tank, 100 Marines, or two amphibious assault vehicles. Loading is not just a matter of cramming Marines and their equipment on board. The loadmaster has to perfectly balance each load, or the LCAC may list uncontrollably, allowing the loss of the cushion of air that holds up the craft. The loadmaster will get the load as, as close to center of gravity as possible, and then the engineer can usually make up the difference by trimming the craft. Uh, the craft has four fuel tanks on all four corners of the craft, and he can transfer fuel forward and aft and port and starboard, and he can usually make up the difference. <laughs> Although the LCAC's flight may look effortless, it requires constant attention. Like highly trained athletes, the crew may make it look easy, but that doesn't mean there's no risk involved. If you don't stay on top of it, it can get away from you. Uh, you use so many things when you're flying that boat. There's, uh, like I said, the guys here that operate these craft, uh, the engineers, navigators are the best in the world, but you're sitting in that seat and you're driving it and you're using your right hand, your left hand, your feet, you've got headphones on your ears, you're talking to the crew, you've got communications coming in, and it's like, uh, it's like riding the edge of a razor, and if you slip, you're gonna get cut. The craft master can't afford any mistakes. He has precious cargo to care for. The Marines on board know that the LCAC's crew members are more than just bus drivers. As they practice together for that perfect assault, they become a tightly knit unit. But there are inevitably a few blunders. We offload the Marines, and you know, Marine Corps personnel, they're pretty motivated. We were down uh, doing a workup, and uh, the Marine uh, staff sergeants were timing their guys to see how fast they could get off a boat. So it was a big contest to see who could get all their guys offload the boat 
in under a minute. We drop the ramp and they jump off. And uh, this one kid, he was so excited. You know, they were getting off in like 45 seconds. He, he cr did the cardinal sin for a Marine. He left his rifle on the boat. And our loadmaster just casually walked out and handed it to his staff sergeant. As we drove off, we could see this kid doing push-ups on the beach with this guy's, you know, standing there just yelling at him. But he never, I don't think, probably ever left his uh, rifle again. April. Any sufficiently advanced technology, Isaac Asimov said, is the equivalent of magic. The people of Bangladesh line the shorelines, watching in amazement as the deafening hovercrafts land on their beaches. Americans and Bangladeshis work side by side, unloading relief supplies, renewing hope in a damaged nation. In two weeks, Navy landing craft complete 46 missions, delivering more than 4,500 tons of relief supplies. A local villager said, as he watched the hovercraft come over the horizon, they came like angels from the sea. A year later, LCACs are also involved in another major humanitarian effort, Operation Restore Hope. December 1992, Marine helicopters and amphibious assault forces land at the Somalian capital of Mogadishu. Their mission, to seize Mogadishu's international airport and seaport to facilitate the arrival of additional Army, Navy, Air Force, and Marine Corps units. These forces would, in turn, provide security for convoys and relief operations supplying food and medicine to war-torn Somalia. Once again, LCACs play a key role in delivering the Marines and equipment necessary to carry out a successful mission. A modern amphibious force remains an effective, flexible asset in dealing with ever-changing geopolitical situations. The addition of LCACs to the American arsenal has opened up shoreline areas that were previously inaccessible. It has allowed the Navy Marine Corps team to be more effective in its delivery of troops and equipment. No longer is it necessary for Marines with 70-pound packs to struggle through chin-deep water. No longer are Marines easy targets for enemy fire as they make their way across the beach. LCACs can speed past the beach and deposit Marines on dry land near cover in precisely the best tactical position. This is an invaluable tool in the Navy's quest to be able to project power from the sea. 